Welcome. Thanks for tuning to Impact. Our mission is to love, learn, and serve. And now, here's the message. Open to James chapter 2, starting in verse 1. If you don't have your Bible with you today, I encourage you to bring it with you next time. And uh, for today, you can grab one of those blue Bibles from the rack in front of you. If you're using one of the blue Bibles, you'll find James 2 on page 1196. Uh, Javier, if you could turn me down a little bit, that'd be great. James chapter 2, starting in verse 1. I'm calling today's message, Warning Favoritism. Warning Favoritism. James chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Say amen with me if you're there. Here we go. My brothers... As believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, "Uh, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, "Uh, you stand over there or sit on the floor down here by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? May God bless us as we study and more importantly, live out his word today. Amen. Pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, this is your word. This is your day. This is your service. It's not about me. It's not about us. It's about you. And Lord, you have told us so plainly that you want us to be doers of the word. And so, Lord, I pray that we wouldn't just listen politely today, but that we would live out what you want us to live out today. God, you are not a God who discriminates. And I pray that we as your followers wouldn't do that either. Speak to us today, God, and and change us, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. I, I hope that God's Spirit moves in a powerful way over these next few minutes as we dive into this passage together. Uh, I'm hoping and praying that there's decisions for Christ in this place today. We know it's going to be a great day, amen? And one of the reasons we know it's a great day is because Frank led us in so well. Great word, Frank. Thank you for leading us into communion, leading us into offering. We also know it's a great day because we've got a new baby with us at Impact for the first time. Giovanni and Kaylee, would you like to introduce your little one to us today? Go ahead. Oh, you can stand right there. It's fine. (laughs) Amen. Amen. Good job. Baby Gabriel, right? Congratulations, you two. Especially to you, Mama. You had the hardest job of the two of you. So great job. We're so happy to have you guys back in church with us. Well, this is such an amazing command that he gives us here in the first verse of chapter 2. We're going to flesh it out, dive into it today. But I was thinking this last week of an illustration I had heard when I was in high school. You see, I went to high school before the days of Sandy Hook and Columbine. When I was in high school, it was in many ways a much more innocent time. And I remember going to a certain youth event. I can't tell you for sure which one it was or even who was sharing this illustration. I just remember hearing it for the first time when I was in high school. The guy up front, the pastor, was telling the story about a certain church service that was going on one Sunday morning when all of a sudden a man barged into the middle of the service with a rifle in hand and he shouted out to the congregation, All right, I'm giving you one chance. If you do not believe this foolishness about Jesus, I'll let you leave right now. Within 10 seconds, 90% of the congregation had left the room. A few handfuls of Christians were still left behind. The gunman saw an empty seat. He sat down in it, put his rifle on the floor, turned to the pastor and said, All right, preacher, I got rid of all the hypocrites. You can continue with the service. I remember thinking as a teenager, I wonder if I'm a hypocrite. Even though I went to youth group just about every week, I went to church just about every week, I remember thinking as a teenager, I wonder if I would have stayed in the room. I wonder 
I believe those Bible verses that say be strong and courageous. I believe those verses that say I should take a stand for my faith. But when push comes to shove, if my life depended on it, would I really stand for my faith? Would I stand for God's word? I wonder. Well, as we saw last Sunday, James writes in James 1 verse 22, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. I like how the New American Standard Bible translates that verse. It says it this way, But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. James made it so clear to us in chapter 1 that following Jesus has never been a matter of politely listening to God's Word, right? It's not a matter of politely listening to God's Word. Following Jesus Christ has always been about doing God's Word, about obeying God's Word, about living God's Word. And as James ends chapter 1 and begins chapter 2, he gives his Christian readers a, a very important command. Right there in verse 1 of chapter 2, he makes it clear in order to be doers of the word, we cannot discriminate, we cannot play favorites. We're going to see today that that's easier said than done. He writes in verse 1, my brothers as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. I want you to notice that before James gives the command, don't show favoritism. James reminds us who we are. Christians, he reminds us who we are. We are believers in Jesus, but we're not just believers in just any old Jesus, are we? He has a few words to describe which Jesus he's talking about, because remember that in James' day, Jesus was a very common name. There were likely thousands of Jesuses in Israel, just as, if the, just as there are thousands of Jesuses in America today. Same name. Jesus is a very common name, especially in Hispanic cultures these days. So just as there are thousands of Jesuses in America today, there were probably thousands of Jesuses in Israel in James' day. And so notice the Jesus that he says that we follow. We believe in, first, the glorious Jesus. Say that with me. The glorious Jesus. In other words, He is the Jesus who is full of majesty. And He's full of splendor. He is the Jesus who is worthy of all honor and praise. He is the Jesus whose character perfectly reflects the character of Father God in heaven. No, He's not just any old Jesus who we believe in. We believe in the glorious Jesus. But wait, there's more. He's not just the glorious Jesus we believe in. He is the glorious Lord Jesus. Remember that the word Lord means master. It means leader. It means boss. It means jefe. And so it means when Jesus gives a command, His followers have to obey that command, right? Because He's the leader. He's the master. He's the boss. He's the jefe. So He says it. We are to obey it. And so James makes it clear that before I give you this command, I want you to know that it's the command of the glorious Lord Jesus. But wait, there's still more. He's not just the glorious Lord Jesus. He is the glorious Lord Jesus Christ. He's Christ. Remember that word Christ is the same as the Hebrew word Messiah. And for hundreds of years, the Jewish people had longed for the coming of their Messiah, the one who is the anointed one, the one who would come to be the Savior, not just of the Jews, but of the whole world. And so they were hoping and longing and praying for the coming of the Messiah. And James basically says here, Christians, don't forget that for hundreds of years, our Jewish ancestors longed for the day that the promised Messiah would be born. Jesus is our long-awaited Messiah, the long-awaited Savior. Savior of the world. So as I give you this command, remember that it is the Savior of the world's command. And so with that kind of lead-in, how could we help but pay attention to the command? This isn't a command given by any old Joe. It's given by our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. Let's give Him some praise and glory today. James is telling us, before I give you this command, I want you to understand, Jesus is indescribably glorious. He is our Master. He is the Savior of the world who saved us from our sins. And He gives us this clear command, don't show favoritism. The word translated as favoritism in the NIV is the Greek word 
prosopolepsia. We're going to put it on the screen here for you. It's the word prosopolepsia. Go ahead and put up that next slide if it's handy. Prosopolepsia. Could you say that with me? Prosopolepsia. This word prosopolepsia interestingly means receiving the face. Isn't that interesting? It means receiving the face. So think about this for a minute. Favoritism and partiality involve a process of looking at people's faces and identifying certain characteristics of their physical appearance. It might be their status. It might be facial characteristics. It might be their ethnic background. The characteristics we see, we identify them, and we choose whether or not we're going to receive them. We choose whether or not we're going to reject them simply based on what we see. To put it bluntly, when I show favoritism, I accept some faces and I reject others. Based entirely on what features I like and what features I don't like. I myself am the judge, the jury, and the executioner. It's all about my opinion. My opinion rules. That's prosopolepsia. That is biblical favoritism. Well, I'd like to honestly ask you a question. And let me even say it this way. I'd like you to ask yourself this question. Do I show favoritism? Ask yourself right now, just you and the Lord listening. Do I show favoritism? Do I accept some faces and reject others simply because of how those people look? Now, I want to give you a sneak peek of what goes on inside the head of someone who's receiving the face and showing favoritism. Now, DJ, we're going to go through these pretty quickly. Okay? Here's what would go through the mind of someone who's receiving the face. Go ahead. First picture. No, too young. Next. Definitely too old. Next. Too tall. Too short. Too black. Ah, oh, definitely too white. Too messy. Too clean. Too rich. Definitely too poor. Too scarred. Too fake. Too tatted. Huh. Now, now that's a face I kind of like. I could see myself talking to this guy. How shallow is that? How shallow is that? How terrible for a believer and follower of Jesus Christ in their minds to be quickly carte blanche ruling some people out for conversation, ruling some people out for investing my time in them simply because I do not like certain characteristics in their face or in their person. But so often we can be more shallow than we like to admit. I like how the contemporary English version translates Jesus' command. It says, don't treat some people better than others. That's short and sweet, isn't it? How about how the good news translates it? Don't treat people in different ways according to their outward appearance. The truth is, in this day and age, people talk a lot about equality and tolerance, but most people, even most Christians, show some favoritism. We don't practice what we preach. We hear what God's Word says about eliminating favoritism, but we don't do what God's Word says to do. We receive the faces of some, but sadly we reject the faces of others. Now, I want to play devil's advocate for a moment. Let's play devil's advocate for a moment. I might say, so we're more likely to go up and talk to a guy that's in a business suit than we are a guy that's pushing a grocery cart and looks like he hasn't had a bath in three months. Big deal. Big deal. I'm more likely to be nice to the lady that looks like Barbie than I am to the girl who's all tatted up and looks like she's a gangbanger. So what? I'm only human, right? I'm only human. So let's tackle the question. Why is it such a big deal to God? 
when we show favoritism? Why is it such a big deal to God when we discriminate? And I suppose there are a few answers to that question, but let me give you one of the big answers. Why is it such a big deal? Well, because we are God's representatives here on earth, right? We're God's representatives here on earth. And so when we play favorites, we imply that God plays favorites. We imply that some people are less important to God than others. Some people are less loved by God than others. And that implication leads people to doubt that God and His Word are really true. It does. It discredits the truth of God's Word, and it maligns God Himself in His perfect character. Years ago, an older and wiser Christian told me, Dane, more is caught than what is taught probably heard that before. More is caught than what is taught. In other words, people will be shaped by our actions more than they'll be shaped by our words. So it really doesn't matter how much I say to someone, I love you. If I treat that person like dirt, I could say I love you all day long, seven days a week, 30 days a month, 365 days a year, and they're not going to believe it, are they? I could tell my wife I love you, but if I'm slapping her around and treating her like dirt, She's not going to believe I love her. If I tell my kids I love them, and I spend no time with them, and I act hateful toward them, are they going to believe my words or my actions? Obviously, they're going to believe my actions. And so, when the Word of God says so plainly, for God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Someone could come into this church and we could speak John 3.16 every single Sunday of every single month of every single year. And if they come into this place and do not sense and feel the love of God, then they're not going to believe that that verse applies to them. Maybe God does love the world, but I don't think He loves me. Maybe God did send Jesus to die on the cross so I could have a relationship with Him in heaven. He may have died on the cross for others, but He didn't die for me. You see, those who represent Jesus Christ cause people who are seeking answers and seeking hope to draw conclusions about Jesus Christ based on those who represent Him. You see, when we show favoritism, we completely misrepresent God to our lost and dying world. And that, my friends, is a sin. Acts 10, 34 and 35, Peter came to realize that God was inviting Gentiles to be saved just like he had invited Jews to be saved. And in Acts 10, 34 and 35, Peter exclaims, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. If you like these verses, you can throw out an amen, by the way. Ephesians 6, 9, Paul wrote this command to slave owners, and we can apply it to employers and bosses today. He says, Masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. And this wasn't just a New Testament reality. God in the Old Testament revealed to Samuel, you remember that great story in 1 Samuel 16, God sends Samuel to anoint the next king of Israel because Saul was a Yahoo. And he sends him to Jesse. And Jesse had all of these sons. And and God had already revealed to Samuel that one of Jesse's sons would be the next king of Israel. And so Jesse comes to Bethlehem. He comes to Jesse. And all the sons are lined up. And he sees the oldest son. His name is Eliab. And he takes a look at him, Samuel does, and says, Man, this has got to be the next king of Israel. He just looks the part. And remember what God said to him in 1 Samuel 16, 7. He said, Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the, he looks at the heart. Listen to the powerful words in Job chapter 34, verses 18 and 19. It says, is God not the one who says to kings, you are worthless, and to nobles, you are wicked? who shows no partiality to princes and does not favor the rich over the poor, for they are all the work of His hands. So would you agree that Scripture is crystal clear that God does not show favoritism? Amen? Would you agree that Scripture is clear that God does not show partiality? So, that being the case, 
We know that God doesn't treat a businessman in a suit better than he treats a skater in shorts. We know that God doesn't treat a senator who buys her wardrobe at Nordstrom's any better than he treats a single mom who buys her wardrobe at the thrift store. Yeah, some of you really like that part, huh? He doesn't treat millionaires better than welfare recipients. He doesn't favor whites over blacks, Asians over Mexicans. He doesn't favor males over females or the young over the old. God does not show favoritism, period. He doesn't do it. Then how dare we as Christ's representatives cause people to doubt this truth about our awesome God by discriminating against them? Picking up in verse 2. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Over the years, different researchers have done social experiments where they have someone on purpose fall on a public sidewalk in plain view of people that are walking by. And they dress that person differently and they study to determine if there is any difference in the response time of people helping someone based on how they're dressed. Guess what they found out? One of the most famous experiments that you can find on YouTube, I looked at this the other day, I've done this in the past, I looked at it again this last week, it's called Homeless versus Businessman Falling. They put a guy in a suit with a cane, he's got his briefcase, and he collapses on a sidewalk in plain view of people. Guess what happens more times than not? The businessman collapses, people from left and right come to help him up. They take the same man and they dress him up like a guy that's been homeless for five years and smells like last week's garbage. And he collapses on the sidewalk. Guess what happens most of the time? People look and keep walking. And it happens consistently time and time and time again. I wonder if you had someone collapse on the sidewalk in front of you and that person happened to be homeless, how would you respond? I've asked myself that question. I hope that I would make no difference based on how that person looked or was dressed. Some pastors have been pretty bold when teaching on this passage and dressed up like a homeless man and come to their own church on a Sunday morning. I thought about doing that today, but I didn't have time to get everything all ready. I wonder how you would respond to me. Want me to speak honestly? Some of you may not want me to. Let me speak honestly. I think you'd treat me really well. We've had some homeless people come to our church in recent months and years. Consistently, I've seen a lot of love being extended from you to those individuals. Christy, our children's director, when we were having our prayer huddle at 9.30 this morning, told us about Michelle, who was just baptized a couple weeks ago. And she told Miss Christy, I've never felt this much love in a church before. And I tell you... tell you, that makes me as your pastor so, so happy. Now let's get a little tougher here. If Bill Gates came into this service today, and he came up and stood beside you and asked, could, could I sit in that chair? Most of us would say absolutely, and we'd scoot over. What if a meth addict came in and did the exact same thing, and stood next to you and said, can, can I sit in your chair? She smells, dark circle around her eyes, looks war-torn, battle-scarred. Would you be as quick to slide over? And if you did slide over, would you slide over three chairs instead of one just to keep some comfortable distance between you and this meth addict? It's a little tougher of a question. When all is said and done, we do tend to show some favoritism. This command is not easy to carry out, but we as followers of Christ must try with the Lord's help to do it consistently. As believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, He says don't show favoritism. In order to be doers of the Word, we cannot discriminate, we cannot play favorites. We must treat all people with kindness and love. 
all people with kindness and love. Say that with me. We must treat all people with kindness and love. Now, in verses 5 through 13, James gives us four reasons why we should not show favoritism to the rich over the poor. Starting in verse 5, he says, Listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have insulted the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you've become a lawbreaker. So speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. You see, mercy triumphs over judgment. So why is it important not to show favoritism when the rich are standing alongside the poor? He gives us these four reasons. The first reason is revealed in verse 5. God has chosen the physically poor to be spiritually rich. That's the first reason we shouldn't discriminate between rich and poor. God has chosen the physically poor to be spiritually rich. In Luke 4.18, Jesus gives His inauguration speech to ministry as He's there in the synagogue in Nazareth, His hometown. And as he's given that inauguration speech, he says, God has appointed me and anointed me to preach good news to the poor. That's the first reason he said that he came to earth, to preach good news to the poor. What a marvelous thing to say there in his hometown. Luke 6.20, Jesus says, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Now Christians, you better thank God that he doesn't show favoritism. Because... If no one has ever told you this, let me be the first to tell you. You ain't that famous. If no one's ever told you before, let me be the first to tell you. You're not that rich either. We come into this place, there's a reason we live in Victorville. And not in Beverly Hills. New York City. Bel Air. Newport Beach. Okay, I don't want to have you start coveting the, these other towns. You know, let's come back here. God has placed you here. You are not exceptionally famous, are you? You are not exceptionally rich. In Christ we are, but monetarily by the standards of this world, we are neither famous nor rich. And so we better be thankful that God does not show favoritism. Otherwise, you and I would be up a creek without a paddle. You and I would be in trouble if He showed favoritism because we're not that great in the eyes of the world. The first reason why we shouldn't discriminate is because God has chosen the physically poor to be spiritually rich. Amen? And that includes those who are financially poor. Catch this. And those who are intellectually poor. It includes those who are socially poor and have terrible social skills. It includes those whose personal hygiene is poor. It includes those whose looks are in the eyes of the world poor. It even includes those whose attitudes are poor. And you're in that group somewhere. I'm in that group somewhere. And I want you to do something for me. Take that word poor and replace it with the word ugly. Take the word poor and replace it with ugly. So here's how it works. God has sent His Son Jesus to those who are physically ugly. Amen? Not too many amens to that one. He sent His Son to those who are financially ugly. How many of you have been through periods in your life where you say, my finances, they are ugly? Amen. Some of you are going through that right now. i got some ugly finances. Those whose intellect in the eyes of the world might be ugly. Those whose social skills are ugly. Those whose personal hygiene is ugly. Those whose attitudes are ugly. Jesus Christ, I am so thankful, does ugly. Jesus does ugly. He came and He specializes in pouring out His mercy and His grace and His love on those who society considers to be poor and expendable and ugly. And if Christ does ugly, so should the church. 
Reason number two is revealed in verses 6 and 7. The rich are persecuting the poor. This is a very practical argument that James makes in uh, this fallen world that we live in. We are tempted to turn on the charm and get all kissy-kissy when someone famous comes into the room, right? Ooh, this person's certified. Is that the right term on Instagram? Whatever it's called. Verified, that's it. Sorry, teenagers, I goofed that one up. So this person is famous. This person's got all these followers. This person makes lots of money. Is it not our human tendency to get all kissy-kissy when someone famous walks in the room? We gravitate to that person. We want to talk with that person. We want that person to acknowledge us. And James says, don't do that. Don't turn on the charm. Don't kiss up to these rich and powerful and famous people. Treat everyone the same. Reason number three is revealed in verses 8 through 11. Favoritism violates the royal law of love, and therefore it is a sin. James here is addressing the second most command, uh, greatest, second greatest command in the whole Bible. Jesus said the second greatest command is love your neighbor as you love yourself. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. It's interesting, I think, that James refers to this second greatest command as the royal law. And so Bible readers for centuries have asked the question, why does he call the second greatest command the royal law? And there have been a lot of answers given, but I just want to give you one today. One of the reasons he calls this command, love your neighbor as you love yourself, the royal command, is because God has called us, you ready for this? God has called us to treat every single person like royalty. Every single person to be treated like royalty. I don't care if they're tall or short, black or white, young or old, male or female, homeless or rich. He says, treat everyone the same like kings and queens, like princes and princesses. Treat everyone like royalty. And imagine the impact we as a church can have if when someone walks into the building, no matter who they are, no matter what their background, no matter how much they've been treated like trash at home or at work that last week, they come into this place and they feel like childs, children of the king because in reality, they are. The King of kings and the Lord of lords has commissioned us to go and tell people that Jesus Christ came for them. He died for them. He loves them. And He wants to adopt them into His family as princes and princesses. What an amazing thing that everyone should be treated as royalty. That's the royal law found in Scripture. Reason number four, verses 12 and 13. Favoritism demonstrates a lack of mercy and will result in judgment without mercy. I don't know about you, but these verses put a little fear of God in me. He's saying, I will not give you mercy, Dane. If you refuse to show mercy to others, if you play favorites, if you show favoritism, if you discriminate, then I'm not going to give you mercy. True mercy doesn't see someone in need as rich or poor. True mercy doesn't see someone in need as black or white or Hispanic. True mercy doesn't see someone in need as male or female. True mercy doesn't hesitate to evaluate where someone falls on the social ladder before deciding whether or not to help them. Jesus makes it clear in the Sermon on the Mount that if you and I don't forgive our brother for their sins against us, then our Father in Heaven will not forgive us for our sins against Him. And in much the same way, James says here that if we refuse to show mercy to those around us who everyone else discriminates against, God will refuse to show mercy to us. So there you have it. A command from our glorious Lord Jesus Christ that we must carry out today and this week and every week of our lives whether you are at home or at church or at work or walking down the sidewalk, do not show favoritism, church. Show mercy to everyone equally. Show kindness and compassion to everyone equally. And no matter what someone looks like or talks like or even smells like, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Warren Wiersbe, I think, says it so well in his commentary. He writes these words. We only believe as much of the Bible as we practice. One of the tests of the reality of our faith is how we treat other people. Can we pass the test? I wonder, 
Can I pass the test? Can you pass the test? How we treat people to a large extent speaks clearly to ourselves, to God and the world about how much we really believe what's in this book here. And so our glorious Lord Jesus Christ says, Church, treat everyone like royalty. Those that are approachable and those that may not be approachable. No matter who they are, no matter what they come from, church, show them the love of Christ. Show them what Jesus looks like in the real world. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. What a glorious word that is for us today. Isn't God's word good? We're going to go into a a time of invitation here. If you're here today on Decision Sunday, we are so thankful, so grateful that you're here. And we know that some of you need prayer. Some of you need to make decisions for Christ today. Maybe some of you are here today and you accepted Christ years ago, but you realize you've been backsliding. And God's been speaking to you over the last few minutes and letting you know today is the day you need to rededicate your life to Christ. Some of you may need to make that first time decision and say, you know what, I'm done playing around with God. And just saying I'm a Christian because my parents were Christians or saying I'm a Christian because my spouse or my kids are Christian. I'm going to make a decision today and letting God know that I am serious myself about following Him. I'm going to turn from my sin and get baptized today. Some of you may have that decision. So I'm going to lead us in a time of prayer as our prayer team makes their way to the stage. I'm going to ask that as I lead this prayer that we have our heads bowed and our eyes closed. And at different points in this prayer, I'm going to ask If you need prayer for something specific, if you do, I just encourage you to raise your hand. And I want to pray for you today if you have that specific need. So you go ahead and close your eyes, bow your heads as we go into this time of prayer. Heavenly Father, glorious Lord Jesus Christ, we come to you. And we thank you that someone in our lives at some point in the past carried out this great command. And maybe everyone around us rejected us, but you didn't. And that representative of Christ who you placed in our path, they didn't reject us either. And I thank you, Lord, so much that each of us who have accepted you as Lord and Savior had someone give us the time of day. Had someone help us when we had stumbled and had fallen. They helped us up. And just like that good Samaritan, they pointed us to Christ. Thank you, Lord, for those who have treated us like royalty. Help us to do the same. Lord, help us to treat our spouses, our kids, our brothers and sisters, our parents, our co-workers, our classmates, our neighbors, with love and mercy and respect and kindness. Help us, Lord, to practice mercy because mercy does triumph over judgment. It may be the mercy we share with someone that ends up leading them to be saved and be set free from the judgment and eternity that comes when we reject Christ. Help us, Lord, to walk in your footsteps. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, if you're here today and you need prayer to carry out what we've just learned from God's Word today, Maybe there's someone in your life, maybe it's at home, maybe it's in your neighborhood, maybe it's at work or school, someone in your life that you have the hardest time treating well. You tell yourself, I'm going to treat them well, and then you just, when you see them, it just all goes down the tube. You struggle to treat them with love and mercy and compassion. If you're struggling with carrying out this command with someone or someone, maybe several someones in your life, would you just raise your hand? I want to pray for you right now. I'm raising my hand with you. Let me pray for you right now. Lord, I pray for those who are struggling to love those that seem so unlovable. Those that are struggling to show mercy with those that don't seem worthy of receiving mercy. Lord, it's one thing to say to treat everyone like royalty, but Lord, there's some people we do not want to treat like royalty. Help us, O God, to have a compassionate and merciful heart like Jesus. Each person that raised their hand, even those that didn't, Lord, but are thinking it, Lord, help us to love as you love. Now, if you're here today and you 
know that you need to rededicate your life to Jesus Christ. Maybe you've accepted Him in the past. You were baptized in the past. But you've been sliding and you want to give your life back to Him today and get back right where you need to be with God. Would you just raise your hand? I want to pray for you today. I think there's some here today that need to rededicate their lives. Just raise your hand. If you need to make that decision today, I see those hands. God bless you. Anyone else? God's watching. You can raise it, raise it nice and high if you need to. Amen. I see those hands. God bless you. Lord, I pray for those that have just lifted their hands in the air and said, Lord, I need to get right with you. I know I'm saved. If I died right now, I would go to heaven. But Lord, I feel like I've failed you in recent weeks. I've, I've not done what you've called me to do. Lord, help each of these to make a fresh start today. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would just guide them into truth. Help them to walk in your truth. To speak and act and even think your truth. Those, Lord, that have not been in the Word like you've called them to be, I pray that even today they would go home, they would open their Bibles and spend time in your Word and make that a new daily habit to spend time with you every day in your Word and in prayer. That they would make it a a new weekly habit to be in your house worshiping you with the church family every week. Lord, help these who want to rededicate their lives to recommit to you today. And we know that you're there with wide arms ready to receive them back. Lord, I pray your blessing on them. Protect them from temptation. Use them in a mighty way for your kingdom. And finally, I want to ask if there's anyone here who's never made that first time decision for Christ. You're not sure if you died today if you would go to heaven or not. If you want to make today the day where you get right with God, I want you just to raise your hand right now. I want to pray with you. Amen. And I see those hands. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Father, I pray for these that are not sure about their salvation. And Lord, I just pray that right now in this moment, they would just speak these words to you, Heavenly Father. I come to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I ask that you would forgive me of my sin. I believe in you. I trust in you. Please forgive me. I want to put you in the driver's seat of my life. Help me turn from my sin. Help me to obey you by being baptized as you've commanded me to be baptized. Letting God, the angels, and anyone who's watching knowing know that I follow you. That I believe in you. And I'm going to serve you from this point forward. Lord, I just pray for boldness for each of these to walk in obedience to your word. To walk in obedience to your commands. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We hope you'll be blessed by this sermon from Impact Christian Church please visit our website at greaterimpact.cc. God bless.